Hi everyone, my name is Ellen Huang and I'm here to share a few reflections about three ceramics decorated with copper pigment on view at the Ackland Art Museum. In the spring of 1729, the Imperial Court Commissioner of Jingdezhen Porcelain, Tang Ying, dispatched Wu Yaopu to Jingzhou, Henan, a region approximately 150 kilometers south of present-day Zhengzhou. Here on the map, it's circled in red, the capital of Henan in central China. Wu Yaopu's mission was archaeological. By order of the office in charge of the imperial household affairs, Wu was supposed to collect shards of ceramic wares at the historical production site of Dringzhou of ceramic wares known as Dring Ceramics. The purpose was to recreate them for the imperial Qing dynasty court. Dring Ceramics are a class of ceramic known for their opalescent blue glazes. Um, most striking of which were those accented by these purple red splashes first produced for the Northern Song emperors during the 10th and 11th centuries, dream wares captivated collectors with their seeming duality. The glaze appears translucent and deep at the same time. It manifests an unctuousness, but adamantine texture. A magnificent example is on view at the Buddha and Shiva Lotus and Dragon exhibition in the Ackland galleries. Pictured here, the glaze's viscosity pauses just before it runs off the vessel foot and highlights the thickness of the glaze layer on top of a tawny ceramic body. The variegated color subtly shifts between the sky blue and the lavender and hazy purple forms that float mysteriously beneath and within the surface. Near the top of the bowl here at the ridge, a tan colored ceramic body peeks through portions of the glaze where it fired transparent. As material scientists now understand, these 11th century dream ceramic glazes are the result of optical effects. During the cooling stages of kiln firing, two separate liquid phases of the glaze emulsify and create arrays of angled light refractions that result in depth and translucency concomitantly. The 11th century dream ceramics mark a significant achievement in the history of the use of copper effects in ceramic glazes. Their characteristic um, splash marks here, all of them show them in sort of lavender, red, purple splash marks on all three objects. Um, are counterintuitive, despite their appearance of spontaneous splashing on the vessel surface, they are actually the result of carefully brush painted pigments, the main colorant being a purposeful addition of copper metallic oxide. After the 11th century, dream potters and ceramic specialists became so technically deft with copper colorants that they were able to produce entire vessel surfaces in a bold and iridescent purplish red glaze. So the expansion from splash marks to all over glazes occur. And I'll give you an example here. If you look at the top, there are these um, indistinct kind of hazy purplish splashes that eventually become the entirety, um, the glaze that covers the entirety of the outside surface. Um, recent research has shown that the later all over purplish red copper glazes that cover the entirety of the vessel often contain a number and a palace name in Chinese incised or stamped on the base of the vessel. So for instance, um, you can see a later all over purple reddish copper glaze and 
and circled in the red on the bottom left image are the incised number mark and a three character name of a palace within the Forbidden City, um, which is this top circle right here. Scholars now consider these numbers and palace names as evidence of interior design plans. The numbers and names function as an instruction that tell the officials where to place the vessel in the interior of a palace located in the Forbidden City. Um, so in this case, the name of the palace is in horizontal right here on the top. And it is actually the palace that corresponds to um, the location that is marked in red rectangle. This is a practice expanded by the Qing Dynasty's 18th century emperors. In the exhibition galleries, viewers will encounter two additional examples of the deployment of copper in ceramic glazes. The contrast um, is quite evident. Both of these objects date about 350 years later than the aforementioned Dring ceramic that exhibits the copper red purple splashes. Here um, are two ceramics and they are both porcelain. On the left is a wide shouldered stately jar and on the right a rather small but elegant round dish. And both date to the Ming Dynasty, whose rule lasted 300 years between three, 1368 to 1644. The Ming imperial rulers extensively funded porcelain production for the court. Together, they highlight the challenges and mastery of the use of copper in glaze. On the left, the large broad-shouldered jar, um, whose silhouette suggests majesty, in its proportions, gentle curve, and strong stature, bears under glaze painted designs, under glaze copper painted designs. Mm. Ceramic specialists painted the pine tree um, and also the plum blossom here on the bottom, right here, this branch, and bamboo in copper pigment onto an unfired vessel, after which they apply glaze. This technique in which sequential process of the design being painted under the glaze is um, a known as a technical expression called under glaze copper. On the right was a vivid um, a porcelain wearing a vivid color which makes visible a monochrome red whose most pronounced feature is saturation. This monochrome hue of the red burns with presence and a closer look will reveal the color strength that stems from nuances that enhance this fullness and richness in the glaze here in these interior curves. Flecks of deep red spots speckle throughout and lend the monochromatic red luscious glaze a full-bodied texture. In English, connoisseurs would refer to this color um, by describing it as crushed strawberries. And as you can see, um, this copper red glaze uh, often leaves the white ridge on the top of the vessel exposed, revealing a white porcelain body underneath. And this is due to the fact that the copper monochrome glaze is actually not a suspension-based glaze, but rather a colloidal, um, not a solution-based glaze, but a colloidal suspension that allows the part particles to run during the firing and heating and cooling process. And the Ackland Art Museum itself has a fine example that dates to the reign of the Xuanda Emperor, the Ming Emperor, whose imperial wares are most associated with these vivid monochrome copper reds. We might extend the fruit analogy further for the Athens work um, in its collection and compare its delectable color to something like crushed raspberries rather than strawberries. In fact, in the 18th century, 
The fervor with which the Qing imperial court invested in recreating historic wares of previous styles at Jingdezhen manifested in the undertaking of archaeological missions, such as that of Wu Yaopu mentioned earlier. So what I'm referring to are something like the Qing reproductions of previous ceramic styles seen here on the bottom row, the tall red, um, copper red monochrome, and also the sort of red splash marks on the container on the right, are both um, reproductions or recreations of previous styles. And they inextricably link the red monochrome porcelains with copper splashed wares from Zhengzhou. In the Qing Chinese language documents, the lively terms for red glazes and copper splashes are very sumptuous, and they give us a sense of the sensoria of red in the 18th century. In the Chinese language, red glaze and copper splash effects were referred to by the terms including um, crab apple red, camel lung, pig liver, eggplant skin, and plum blossom flower. As these three copper pigmented ceramics show here on this screen, these three objects use uh, copper in very different ways, result in a diversity of surface qualities and color effects. From purple splashes on the top left within a light blue glaze to copper painted designs and also rich deep vermilion monochromes. But what accounts for the wide diversity of copper qualities in ceramic designs? Several reasons might be given. First, the appearance of underglaze painted designs and red monochromes could be the result of political dynastic change. In the 14th century, the Yuan dynasty, whose ruling family was a khanate of Mongolian lineage, fell to a rebellion led by a peasant named Zhu Yuanzang. After vanquishing the Yuan Mongolian rule, Zhu Yuanzang established the Great Ming Dynasty. Because the name of its founder, Zhu, means red, historians have long surmised that the appearance of underglazed copper painted designs was a decisive visual strategy, a shift that symbolically distinguished the Ming Dynasty's new political rulership from the preceding dynasty, the Yuan. And I'm going to show an example that shows this shift. And I think the palette change is quite clear. Um, the object on the left is an underglazed blue painted porcelain. It's the palette that was popularized during the Yuan Dynasty, and it is on view as well in the same exhibition at the Ackland. Um, and it contrasts strikingly with the underglazed copper red designs on the porcelain jar, which was developed, um, a palette developed during the last or latter half of the um, 1300s meaning the first decades of the Ming dynasty. And a second possible reason might be the centralization of the Ming court's interest in the ceramic making site of Jingdezhen, located in Southeast China here by the arrow. Um, after consolidating power, the Ming royal family initiated a concerted effort in creating porcelain for the imperial court with specific imperial styles. They poured money and treasury into the organization of kilns, artisans, and workshops in and around Jingdezhen. Whereas the copper splashed wares called dream ceramics were made in the province of Henan, where we circled previously at Zhengzhou, or today's Zhengzhou, the Ming court centralized the court patronage of porcelain um, from Jingdezhen. So according to historical documents, the Ming court at times commissioned up to 450,000 wares in a single year. And that type of imperial order 
clearly would have taken months to fulfill. Against the pure white body of Gina Dunn porcelain, copper's red effect glows brighter and serves as a very vivid and colorful contrast against the white porcelain. A third reason for the diversity effects may be technical. The copper painted designs on the large jar fires gray in some areas. The red gleams in other patches, most prominently and visibly here in the bottom third where the panels are, where the red hue is more evident. This is, no, um, this is because of the notoriously unruly nature of copper pigment. whose resulting color was difficult to control after the kiln firing steps. Archaeological, sh archaeological shards and extant objects in museums, such as the one shown here, often exhibit areas where red fades to gray on a single object due to firing variables, in particular due to the rapid changes um, needed between oxidation and reduction atmospheres of the kiln firing process. As a result, this jar um, in the exhibition has botanical symbols like the plum blossom branch and also the pine leaves and bamboo that fires and appears awash in a gray scale, creating a ghostly look. It is this incontrollable nature of red that is precisely the feature of copper red glazed ceramics that historical sources emphasize repeatedly. Um, this is a text recorded in a um, letter written by a French Jesuit missionary who visited Jin de Jun in 1712 and early 1720s. He wrote, quote, I was given a piece of porcelain called Yao Bian, or transmutation. This transmutation happens in the kiln and is caused either by a defect or from excess heat of some unknown cause. In the opinion of the worker, this piece was not successful and was caused by pure chance, but it is no less prized or beautiful. The worker had planned to make a souffle red vases but this one came from the kiln resembling a piece of agate, unquote, end quote. Um, the themes of that emerge in the missionary's account of being given the gift of porcelain by a Jindajan artist are unpredictability and chance, contingency. In addition, the description reveals that the objective of the artisan was to make a red vase described here as souffle, a gastronomical term, but rather he ended up firing a resulting porcelain that looked like agate. We cannot ascertain the exact object that was given to the French missionary, but we might entertain these two objects on this slide, which may um, visualize the similarity of that which was described and given to the Jesuit. So a red face that may look like agate or has some um, striking flaring sort of uh, forms that appear on the red surface, much like the interior of agate. Clearly the artist thought highly of the piece. He mentioned as the missionary wrote that it was, um, a result of pure chance, no less beautiful or prized. And the key phrase that I'd like to point out is highlighted in red. Literally, the two red characters, Yao Bian, um, translate to what means what we say in English is kiln transformation. And this might indicate the critical stage in ceramic making that remains somewhat autonomous from human control and agency. Um, the process of firing that uh, can be described as magical transmutation 
and in this case from a monochrome red glaze into an agate. So what exactly does this phrase Yao Bian signify? In fact, the phrase has a long textual history in scattered prose collections, and I'd like to offer a few examples that will enable us to imagine the constellation of meanings that animate the production of copper red colors through a discussion of these Yao Bian texts or kiln transformation in English. One of the earliest references to Yao Bian or kiln transformation appears in a historical text dating to the 12th century. The author's name was Zhou Hui, and it is a much less sanguine text situating kiln transformation in an ominous tone. Zhou Hui records that, quote, in Jing the Jun, kiln transformation that took place during the Da Guan reign, the red was like vermilion. Such occurrences were seen as a type of witchcraft, and thus the potters would immediately destroy them into fragments. As we can see, the writer Zhou Hui describes how the kiln transformation induced fear and were per perceived as a form of witchcraft. In another vignette from the same Song period, collected in the text Song Bei Lei Chao, um, an author writes that, quote, Rao Zhou Jing De Zhen is the place from which ceramics comes. During the Da Guan reign, Yao Bian occurred. In just a short time, the color was like that of cinnabar, end quote. In both of these texts written during the Song period, um, the cognate form of ceramic are brilliant red Jing De Zhen porcelain. And so thus Yao Bian is frequently connected to this um, Yao, uh, to, to the brilliant vivid red monochromes. While the earliest recorded texts we have from the Song period link the production of blazing vibrant red ceramics from Jing De Zhen to the phenomenon of Yao Bian, by the 1700s, so about 400 years later, the Ming Dynasty, Yao Bian as a phenomenon included a much expanded repertoire of ceramic types, um, including celadons. So in addition to red glazes, uh, Yao Bian can also refer to something completely different um, with a totally uh, different look. So here you're seeing two gray blue celadons that exhibit the crackle often analogized as broken ice natural patterns in Chinese texts of this period. Um, and in fact, in one collector's manual, an anecdote about the occurrence of Yao Bian or kiln transformation um, directly links the firing of Ge ceramics pictured here or um, Guan ceramics to the um, instance of Yao Bian. Other mysterious texts deepen the sort of um, mystical aspects as they record and narrate Yao Bian as a process of metamorphosis from ceramic to sculpture, such as um, those in the shape of butterfly, birds, phoenix, and leopards. Some records of Yao Bian even include um, instances of ceramic change that are material transformations similar to alchemy in which one substance becomes an entirely different material. For example, um, in the book, Essential Criteria for the Investigation of Antiquities, kiln transformation is said to have produced jade like this from an unfired ceramic. And another testimony from another book um, from the late Ming dynasty, uh, an instance of Yao Bian included the process of trying to fire a porcelain object, which was in the shape of a screen, but through firing, it became a wooden bed. And after a second firing, the bed then transformed or morphed into a boat, something like that. And as the foregoing discussion of wide ranging textual sources illuminate, 
dating to as early as the 12th century and continuing through the 18th century, so over 600 years, the phrase Yao Bian therefore addressed a spectrum of processes that encompassed a range of materials as well as miracles, uh, miraculous and um, fantastical transformations. Despite the supernatural intonations of such historical anecdotes, what unites these texts is the marvelous incomprehensibility and the nature of Yao Bian as occurring beyond human effort or ability. Perhaps most inexplic inexplicable is a particular text <clears throat> written in the late 1630s. It was an encyclopedia about technology entitled Tian Gong Kai Wu, or The Heaven's Craft and the Openings of Things. It was first published in 1637 before the French Encyclopedia by Diderot. And in the chapter about ceramic making, the author, Song Mingxing, wrote about the difficulties of working with copper on porcelain. And he recounted an event that can be described as a paranormal activity about the challenges of creating a monochrome red porcelain. Um, the author Song narrates that, quote, in the Zhengde reign, a eunuch was appointed to supervise the manufacture of porcelain for the imperial court. This was a time when the process of making Xuande red porcelain, that is the same type of porcelain that we've seen that are monochrome, like the one in the Aklan and on view in this exhibition. It was a time when this technology was lost and failing to produce it, the eunuch paid the penalty with his and his relatives lives. Then one of the potters killed himself by jumping into the burning kiln. Later, he appeared in another person's dream, who was then able to produce it. News of this event of Yao Bian was widespread and was known as Yao Bian or kiln transformation. Subsequently, the story was enlarged by those who love miracles to include such points as the kiln producing strange things like deer and elephants, end quote. For a book about material technology, the inclusion of this fantastic story is a reason for incredulity. Not only does the encyclopedia suggest that Yao Bian or kiln transformation is a process in which inanimate things become animate beings, like an animal, deer, or elephants, just by firing in the kiln. This encyclopedia predicates the ability to make a copper red monochrome glaze upon death or the self-sacrifice of a potter, and even more, his spectral apparition from beyond the dead. After all, the red glaze could only be achieved after the potter's spirit spoke from beyond the grave or the kiln. Clearly, red is so difficult that the technique and laborious craftsmanship are insufficient to successfully make it. Whereas craft is typically conceptualized as a distinct domain belonging to the body rather than of the mind and concept. To make monochrome red glazes, mind, body, and spirit are necessary, at least according to this encyclopedia. Incredibly, the successful making of copper red monochromes can only happen, according to this textual anecdote, through a journey that crosses life and death and emerges from the liminal space of dreams, appearing in that other person's dream who was a, finally able to make it. To conclude, we can reconsider these three copper red designed wares in light of these lesser known aspects of their making. This talk has, has explored the significance of the copper red in ceramics beyond political and technical contours. And to some of us, such anecdotes may be examples of hearsay, instances of bizarre fiction, and simply morbid. However, 
can there actually be a more appropriate example or manifestation of yao bian or kiln transformation um, than these indeterminate nebulous hazy purple red splash marks could it be that the saturated red glaze might actually comprise the blood of the artisan and how do we represent the ghost who spoke and finally enabled the successful firing, the phantasmagoria, but to allow copper red colloidal suspensions to fade to gray and create hologram figures? Perhaps to know the answer, we must only dream and see. Thank you.